the first session I attended was, it was called Cosmo Trends, and it was the top trends that they're predicting for the next five years. And then the second session was about accessibility in beauty industry. And it was everything from like what you think of accessibility in terms of like physical accessibility to social accessibility as well. Welcome to this week's episode of Beauty Babble. Today, I'll be sharing insights from the Cosmoprof show in Las Vegas. Suzanne, how are you this morning? I'm okay. I'm just, you know, I'm going to have to live this through you. <laughs> yes. I didn't get to go. <laughs> I know. So this show was okay. in July. So last, we're recording in August. Let's go. Yeah. Yeah. Let's go couple weeks ago right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and this is the Cosmoprof North America and I attended two informational sessions that were super interesting and I wanted to share it with you and our listeners the the first session I attended was it was called Cosmo Trends and it was the top trends that they're predicting for the next five years mm -hmm. and these trends are not pulled out of their out of thin air but it's really based on what they see brands are producing for products, what they're approaching them with. And then the second session I attended was about accessibility in beauty industry. And it was everything from like what you think of accessibility in terms of like physical accessibility mm -hmm. to social accessibility as well. So that one is, was really interesting. So yeah. let's talk about that first one. What are the trends? What are they saying? Okay, so because I'm always curious about that. That's something where we've tried to highlight in our discussions so that we can help our listeners keep on track and stay on top of it, right? Because it's such a competitive market. Totally. And you know what? There was one that surprised me, maybe a couple, but <laughs> there was a few that really weren't weren't really surprising because we've seen these trends come up, right? So the first one is you inclusively, and this is beauty that works for textured hair and melanin rich skin. It's better. I, right. I don't, I don't they're get They're very, very good. I know, but they're actually just by what you, what they were named, it draws the awareness and attention to go to the workshop or to, to listen, because a lot of the times when you go to these shows, they're, they're brand related and they're actually selling you something. So it's really good when you can go for actual information. So tell us more, Jermaine. <laughs> okay. So they say that Black U.S. consumers, beauty spending rose by $1.3 billion between 2022 and 2023. And the global hair braiding market is projected to reach a value of $625 million by 2032. Um, and among the needs that brands are zeroing in on are the requirements of braided hair, scalp care for textured hair and hyperpigmentation. And I think this is this is interesting because it's uh, refreshing in a way, right? Because it's finally textured hair. It it handles differently. Like my hair is it's really thick. It's a blend of like wavy, some curly. And anytime, I remember when I was younger and I'd go get my hair done, they would always, or when they try to brush my, it's like, you cannot brush my hair when it's dry. It's like, it just becomes a mess. So there was things that really, there was a lack in knowledge and I don't even have like extremely textured hair, right? So it's, I could just feel this being such a, a refreshing thing for people. Mm -hmm. The big market. And you were saying that was the, the black population in the U.S.? You, it was based on that, hey? It was based on that. And then you think of the skin itself, like it's a tricky thing when you get into the higher Fitzpatricks of how to deal with it and how you can, it can go very wrong, you know? So thinking about what you're doing with your clientele. And I think, I, I think this came up in one of our podcasts, how we were speaking with one of our guests and they said that the esthetician didn't know what to do with her skin because of her Fitzpatrick. And that concerned the client. So it's a, it's a great way to kind of remind our professionals, if you, you know, keep reaching out and learning and growing with it so that you stay on top of these things, because it is different. It's no different than you have someone like Fitzpatrick one. Yeah. So they're almost the one end to the other on that spectrum. So they're uh, a lot more sensitive to having adverse effects, if you wish. 
that's yeah. true and it was the show floor like where brands are presenting their products there was a whole section dedicated to black owned brands and mm -hmm. skincare lines hair care lines so it really was highlighted and brought to the forefront mm -hmm. which again is makes it easier to connect with to learn about and brings it center stage right and this is another avenue that maybe people are haven't thought about actually all those considerations when you're dealing with you know it's like we sometimes forget why the Fitzpatrick's are so important <laughs> yeah but he said even in the permanent makeup world right this it's the same thing lip blushing is huge because they tend to have a darker lip and you become like this expert you know it's your niche that you can nail those colors very unique i find it very interesting myself but you know or you have people who are doing artificial nails you know mm -hmm. their nail plates are different a little bit different in color so i think it's being really just in tune with those diversities and people that it's not all for one yeah. i think that's, a lot of people know that but i think it's just a good refresher right and how how our industry is becoming more inclusive that way like really gearing into specifics it's actually not a very new new trend i mean here in edmonton uh, in edmonton canada that's where we are we actually had a big weekend workshop of different vendors at the the YMCA, local YMCA, which I, I work part-time there, but, and it was the U of A dermatology department that was focusing on, on the black communities here in Edmonton to help them with their diet. So they had nutritionists, they had psychologists, they had the dermatologist side of it. When they recognized it's so different and there's not enough information out there. So and this was three years ago now, so it's not, it's not new. I think we just yeah. keep hearing things and reminding ourselves. It's good reminders, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So the next one we have is the youth vote. So this one, I don't know why I was shocked by this. I, nobody I talked to was surprised. So this is about Gen Alpha. Gen what Alpha. Age, what, what age group is that? Let's if, see. I, can't, I don't know. You're going to, if you're sit, if you're not sitting down. It's, I think it's, it's my kid. It's your kid. Yeah. Both of them. Oh my God. Okay. Born from 2010 to 2024. This is it's a pretty big range. It is. So it's like, I, and some of those, when they talk about like the generation breakdown, give or take a few years, some of them of have course. like different yeah. uh, ranges, but. Are you really this, talking about the 12 year old to the 18 year old? Is that fair to say? No, it's older. It's younger. Really? Like 12, eight? 12. So Zoe, my daughter's 12 and she was born in 2012. So 14 to like eight, seven, six year olds. These are the, this is the range. It says 2024, but I don't think a baby's got a, um, any yeah. power. So it so says, Gen say, Alpha. you know what? So I'm going to say something because moms, like parents are out looking for you know, what are, what's healthy for their babies to put in the bath, put in on their skins. And right, actually. So I guess it's not necessarily that the little ones like that have the buying power, but it's the parents who are focusing on it. Right. And I think that is actually the point where I think why this is a trend, because I think Gen Alpha's parents are more, they're more in a place where they can afford luxuries maybe, or they're more conscious of organic products or prioritizing different things right so i think that lends to what is happening with this generation and so what they're saying is gen alpha's economic footprint is set to reach 5.46 trillion by 2029 so almost as much as gen z and millennials combined spending power <laughs> oh my god <laughs> there are almost 10,000 posts tagged Sephora kids on TikTok. <laughs> oh, that would be interesting to see. Right? So it's also here in California, a bill to ban the sale of over-the-counter skincare products labeled as anti-aging or containing vitamin A and its derivatives is said to be heard by the state's committee. And they and I think this this is passed because younger kids are purchasing these products. Because the demand. 
because of the demand. Yeah. Wow. Retinals? Isn't that crazy? So they did feature some, so some pro they also like showcase some products during the session that are like brands that are catering to, to Gen Z or no Gen Alpha. Sorry. There was one, it, they called it bright girl. And this one is a moisturizer. They have another cleanser and you, this one is called a, your skin stuff and the packaging on it. It's like really funky and colorful. Of course. Right? Oh my gosh. This one's really cute. This is from Orin Medical and it's superstar pimple patches and they're star shaped. <laughs> and they come in this really cute, like yellow case. <laughs> wow. Okay. Now we know why Gen Alpha, Gen Alpha spending power. Cause I'm like, I would totally buy that for my kids. <laughs> right? See? Who's creating it, Doreen? Uh, totally. And then this one, actually, I did pick this up for my kids. This is Talomi. It's uh, makeup and it's it's eyes, lip, and cheek. So it's this makeup stick and you can use it either as for the eyes, the lips, or the cheek. And they're so cute. Lots of really good colors and then like good stuff in there for them. Nice. So Bright Girl is created by a dermatologist in, in the USA. Yeah. And that's because of her kids. I just read her story. Oh, awesome. Briefly, I had to look and say, what would make a dermatologist go out and cater to this? Obviously, got it now. Wow. Very interesting. Right. Like food for thought for people when they're looking at things. Well, we've met some professionals that have talked about what's going on with their kids who are, and they're throwing spa parties and little gift bags. Mm -hmm. And you said hashtag Sephora. Is that what it was? Hashtag Sephora? Sephora kids. Kids, right. So it's like, wow. so if you're looking at your clients have kids, is that is something that you would even want to explore? Right. How do you bring that in? And in fact, when I look back, when I had my spa, I had moms then wanting to do birthday parties. And I was mm -hmm. like, gosh, what do I do with eight-year-olds? Like, you know, because it was yeah. more that anti-aging and everything like that. So, you know, we, we played with it and we did one group. I brought in stuff that they made their scrubs with their flavors, yeah. a little table. And then now it's all coming back to me, but, and they, they got to pick which one they wanted us to use on them for their feet. Oh, that's such a good idea. I should get you to put my daughter's next birthday. <laughs> You're so good with your ideas. Well, and it's like, how do you, how do you do this? So I'm like, oh, what can we do for these? They're, mm -hmm. I mean, kids, right? So we can't be too aggressive. We can't do too much. They love the paraffin. Well, that's yeah. not horrible. It's just hydrating and, you know, a scrub is okay for the skin. And, you know, we're just being really hyper aware of those things and then telling them how to take care of their nails. And so when you go back, that's actually a long time ago. I'm not yeah. going to say how long ago that was, but it's a long time ago. So it kind of makes sense. It was happening then. But it was very, very new because I remember mm -hmm. that, like, oh, kids, like most stuff. <laughs> I don't want to deal with kids. And, and I the, think it's more like it's definitely more mainstream now. Yeah, um, way more common. But I think it's also good to contact whatever your skincare brand is and see their educator, like what of the products is suitable for younger skin. Because mm -hmm. even exactly. with my kids, like I've gotten stuff from Beauty Cult for them, but Tara has been like, okay, here, this is good for their skin, right? Like, kind of right. told certain products that would be suitable for mm -hmm. their skin from Bernard Cassier. Um, obviously not everything is going to work on younger skin, but I would definitely see what you already have and how can you do a little package, a market. It could be just a marketing thing where you pull a couple products and this could be like your back to school kit or something like that. I don't know. Oh, so that's a great idea. Back to school. Right. Thinking outside, yeah. thinking like, what can you do mm -hmm. with what you have as well as what, like, if you're exploring, getting new things, keeping that in mind. But yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I think it's, it's definitely gotten me to look at my spending habits towards my kids. And I'm like, hmm, okay. <laughs> Cool. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Okay. So the next one is called Private Matters. This is as the intimate care market was valued at 40 billion in 2023 and is expected to grow at a 4.5% rate between 2024 and 2032. 
the global sexual wellness market is expected to exceed 90 billion by 2029. That's insane. Natural ingredients are taking center stage in this new wave of elevated intimate care with activities with actives such as organic skull cap, probiotic blends, and organic coconut oil. Some of the products. So we have this one is hydrating intimate cleansing gel. And this one is, it's from China, Hong Kong, and it's just labeled intimate care, personal care product. Mm. The next one is a hygiene hero. <laughs> this one, I, I got some comments. It's a Vipstick serum. This is from the US. The company is very white. So maybe I don't, it's, it looks like a little, you know, those deodorant, those round deodorant tubes. It kind of looks like that. Like a deodorant stick? Yeah, it looks like yeah. a deodorant stick. And then the next one is called Coco Wow. I don't, this is from the US as well. And I don't see, I don't know. So this one, I don't have as much information what exactly this product does, if it's a cleanser or, or okay. what. But I thought the Vipstick one was interesting. I guess when they're creating this, you've got to look at that. Like it's, it's almost like even like an acne stick on the pimple, like they're rubbing on it. There must be ingredients in it to keep the pH proper and the, um, you know, bacterial aspect of things. Cause that yeah. was the first thing that came to my, to my mind is what, like, what is, that doesn't sound sanitary. Yeah. I would imagine though, that they would, I guess something that if, if someone's looking at doing that, cause I remember, I'm sure it's still there at one of the distributors. That was a hot commodity back in the day. I'll say of everything to do with the private areas and it was more natural it wasn't harmful that's the thing is people are demanding it not to be the chemically yeah. you know douching days right like that they know that's not good for women because it mm -hmm. altered all the microbiome in this in that area so i think if you're if you're a person who's let's say doing brazilian is this something of another nature that you could talk to your clients about Right. That's so probably a really good idea. I just looked it up just because I was a little bit curious and it's supposed to like it's for soothing, hydrating and protecting the labia and surrounding skin. And they the directions for use is obviously they recommend that you do it on clean, like, uh, you know, three to four times on clean labia and clitoris. So right. after the shower or something, but three to four times, well, you're going to have to clean yourself in between. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's not really a new product, but I guess as as we keep looking and growing in this industry, people are just becoming more focus aware of self care in all aspects to everything. I guess it has it has a probiotic blend. It has ashwagandha. It no. has a peptide complex. So they're really looking at like a more natural. Yeah, and, and for that membrane too, right? I mean, you can't just use anything down there. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. So maybe the, you know, waxing people, body care professionals, that, that type of thing. Like maybe these are things that you got to look at. What do you have currently in your supplies? Never thought to be creative. I mean, like That's I look, great. I look at Baird and Twell in the U.S. They, they have their own, you know, vaginal facial. That's because, right. Because of the waxing because of the Brazilian, they're trying to keep the area very healthy, yeah. you know, and they recognize there's a membrane involved, but yet, you know, the skin itself, you know, ingrown hairs and all those things, right? So it's how to take care of the all skin areas, I guess, right? So yeah. Yeah. And they call, they call it the credential cleanse. Yes. It they do. It, yeah. It doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't to, to me like it's, it's so in case somebody is looking for it, it's, you know, yeah. Just, I think we did a show on it actually. Oh, yes. When we talk about Brazilian, you're right. We yeah. did have facial. Mm -hmm. And actually it, it, it does help the client if they've got the ingrowns so or they're breaking out and it's such a quick, like right then and there, people feel different. They feel the soothing aspect, the calming aspect, they feel better, but they still need to do the home care side. So you got to teach them to keep up with it for home, right? Yeah. Okay. Before we move on, I was curious. I'm like, what is this? Coco, wow, why does it not say what it is? It's an intimacy oil. So it's kind of like a natural lubricant. Okay. Okay. Curiosity has been answered. All right. 
the next one is life in motion and this one is about you know active uh, brands that are catering towards active lifestyles on the go lifestyles the global af athleisure that was a hard word to say athleisure personal care market is estimated to be worth 203 billion in 2024 and it's going to rise to 299 billion by 2029 so help to find what is who are they who's that niche that they're after athleisure i don't know let's see if it, i it comes up hold on products and ingredients that can prevent breakouts caused by sweating while working out are one of the sector's core areas also key are on the go formats that allow consumers to have serious skincare and body care with them to the gym or to use during workouts so that's that's okay kind of that's what interesting because there's more and more from the fitness side of the world the demand of they were talking about how much like chemicals are in those really popular brands. I'm not going to say them. You know what they are for workouts. Most a lot of people in this industry wear them as part of their uniform because it's so comfortable. Oh, okay. They're not natural. What do you call it? Not ingredients. But the fabrics. Fibers. Actually, yeah, they're actually like a a chemical produced. It's like a plastic. Oh. Yeah. I was like, what? I did not know my leggings could be plastic. So yeah, when you, look at, yeah, when you look at, you know, they, they really market the fact that awareness about your plastics, are you warming your food up in it? Um, what are you storing in your plastic? What are you drinking your water bottle out? Of? But it's in our clothes. So when they're coming to this, I guess I understand what they're talking about and, and underwear, um, the, uh, athletes bras or the, or actually just bras right? Like all the clothing, mm -hmm. there's a lot of chemicals in it. And that's yeah. why they keep it so cheap. Well, I shouldn't it's say that. Scary. They don't yeah. sell it very cheap, but they can, <laughs> they can make it pretty cheap. Interesting. Okay. So some here, let's talk about some of the, the products that they featured for this one. Well, one of them is Canadian, actually. I think this is one of the few that was in Canada and it's called will performing sorry will perform Epsom salt shower stick oh so that's one I want I'm trying to like talk and google it <laughs> yeah well and I guess yeah. when you look at, if you're on the go you're going to look for the quick travel size you're not going to be carrying your big bottles around so when you go into some of these retail places where your clients go you know, I, I've heard of a couple and I remember going in going, oh, all these flavors and scents and you know what I mean? And it's like, yeah. oh my God, it's just, I can't even be in there. It's so strong and it's well, so and this, artificial. This is really for like sore muscles. So they're huh? saying sore muscles meet your match. So it's, it's you use it in the shower, which makes sense because you're on the go. Maybe you're showering at the gym. You can't like soak your body in, in Epsom salts. So this is a kind of, answers that niche oh like, that's really cool packaging is really cool. when you look at it there's a few brands we know already that they have the anti-inflammatory the leg draining cream anti-soreness the muscle fatigue but i think what we forget is we're thinking oh the professional body treatment mm -hmm. okay how does that correlate at home for these for these clients a hundred percent and i think that's why even with the last one i'm like ask your the brand that you're working with because i think a lot of this is really about how you, what you name it. If you can't change the names of the brand, but maybe you can make your little own little kits or because it's really about how it's marketed and what yes. it's geared towards, right? So it's it's always a good reminder. I think we keep saying this, talk to your brand, mm -hmm. what your distributor, what do yep. they have currently and how can they help support you with it before yeah. you go and buy a new product? Not always do you have to go out and buy it. Mm -hmm. the show and then you're really like intense and enticed right dream and you're like oh that looks good I'll buy that <laughs> that's me that's me <laughs> I'm like oh it's shiny I'll get it don't do what I do so okay, okay I'm gonna go through some of the other products under this life in motion one of them is a pre-workout anti-pollution serum literally it's like oh I need this <laughs> this is a powerhouse serum it has antioxidants so I think it's it's really 
interesting because even I was with Tara at the show and she was like, oh, but that's like Two Wells Detox. The mm-hmm. I'm like, oh yeah, I should probably get that. So it's just like, again, see what, what brands you're working with and what do they have that can meet the need of this trend. And the next one is from Switzerland and it's a body deodorant. Okay, so that's the life in motion. And then the the last one is the Senscape. So oh. I like think of this as soon as she said it in the present, I'm like, oh, I think they mean holistic. So this is how I'm thinking of it, but I'll read out their thing. So multi-sensory products are important to consumers who want to experience a more holistic, indulgent form of beauty. Future market insights forecast that sensory modifier market is valued at 6,092 million in 2024 and will rise to 9,977 and 77 million by 2029, reflecting the crucial role of these additives in enhancing products appeal and sensory experience. Among interesting textures and concepts are, you'll like this, solid to oil formats, balm to oil to scrub cleansers, and mm. still feeling emollient. So it feels like a little bit of a, you know, play, they're playful, they're changing in their texture. The first, the first one is a gelid solid lip oil. It's makeup. Mm-hmm. Another makeup, dewy jelly lip, skincare. Oh, this one is the one they were talking about. This skincare, it's from South Korea. And it that's the one that goes from an oil. It goes from a an oil to a scrub, balm to oil to scrub cleanser. And then the last one is an anti-age light cream. Which again, I think all of these have that play on texture. And the changing texture. Oh, and there's another, there's a cleanser here from a Canadian brand as well. And this one is, again, something that it changes in texture as the cleanser. So these are things we've experienced with brands that we've worked with. Mm -hmm. Uh, And it's really, for me, it highlights the explaining things to your clients, right? When, like, when you, when you hear about these things, like when I would, when I would try to keep up with what's going on when I had my business, I would listen to it and always look at, okay, what can I do? what do I have already? And I just got to reword it yeah, or package it, like you said, differently. Or so you don't have to go out and buy the new product because it's the trend. And I think it, it is really important to just stay in the know, knowing and yeah. planning, right? You don't have to jump on the trend now, but it can be something where you just keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening if it's something you can plan towards, see what your clients are mm-hmm. asking for and just well, and then, informed. Yeah. And you're saying the holistic side, it's not going away. We've been saying this for how long you got to look at it. So if you are a lash tech, how do you make it more holistic? What are the sensories that you can target the visual, yeah. the hearing, you know, the smell and what's the, what's the taste or, and touch. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting stuff. Good to know we're we're on, we're on it. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I think that was it for the trends session and then the other session I attended was on accessibility. And this was actually research that was done by the Fashion Institute of Technology. And there were three different presenters and they were from like bigger cosmetic brands, but they were doing and then it was in partnership too with the Fashion Institute Technology. I think there was some universities involved. Mm -hmm. And so they had kind of broke it down in terms of accessibility, but it it talked about economic, social, and inclusivity impacts in the beauty industry. Mm -hmm. The first one was on enhancing accessibility for all people when it comes to products. So looking at packaging, And this is really geared more towards those who are making the product, right? Because as estheticians and professionals, you might not have as much control over how your product is packaged, Mm -hmm. right? But some things that were focused on was for folks who are visually impaired, like differentiating products, whether it's through symbols, like raised symbols on the packaging, For folks who are neurodiverse, looking at just not having overly stimulating packaging. And another one was looking at 
how packaging is or bottles, like how they're shaped and how it affects people with limited mobility and dexterity. And it pointed out to a few brands like Fenty and Rare Beauty that are already have changed the way that their bottles are packaged. I thought it was really cool because for me, it was some things that I never thought of. And I think a lot of us seldom think of these things if we're not experiencing them. So it was it was interesting to kind of get that insight into just how things are packaged. And then the other, the other thing that they talked about too, was not just in terms of the products, but in terms of your, they called it the omni-channel experience. It said 98% of websites don't reach accessibility standards. So looking at your website, your product descriptions, and just how you are marketing yourself and your brand. So there's a lack of representation over generalization and the idea that having images of diversity is not enough, but it being like part of your values and mission as an organization. Yeah. I think for this can trickle down to everybody in terms of how you market yourself too, right? Like thinking about how you are, how, how is your website? How is your, how are you marketing yourself in, in your place, like your studio or your uh, spa or, oh, and online too. Especially online. Cause it's huge. Uh -huh. Yeah. yeah. So true. Okay. And so I left this to the last, cause I found it the most interesting, which was, they called it social accessibility and it, it's addressing holistic wellness in women's lives. And the speaker for this one like came up and she, what did she say? She said, puberty, vagina. She's just, I'm making you uncomfortable. And I'm like, no. But, and the reason she was talking about bringing this stuff up was the fact that there's not enough focus on women's health and education and research. And she said something like 1% of health research is geared towards women's health issues. And doctors spend two this is according to the speaker doctors get two hours of education on menopause in their four years of medical school which yeah. isn't so they broke it down into the different phases of a woman's life in the in terms of puberty fertility and menopause mm -hmm. and menopause being the one that gets the least amount of attention information but even some of the other ones like she had mentioned, everybody knows that Rogaine is a, like everybody knows what Rogaine does. It's like how many brands were created to address women's hair loss after pregnancy, right? So all these things that are geared towards men are not equally geared towards women. She talked about, she focused a lot on, on menopause. Hormone, she talk, said hormone conditions are underfunded and under-researched. Mm -hmm. 72% of women feel brands should support women's health. Where was the other numbers I was telling? 42% of women who go through menopause experience depression. 83% feel ashamed. And she talked about how women who are going through menopause because of the depression and everything that they're going through are more likely to leave the workforce at that stage in their life because there isn't enough information out there, right? So they don't have access to information. Doctors are not bringing up menopause. They don't talk about it. It's not available, available easily available. Well, they're not given the information. But they don't know. No. And there's, yeah. there, I was listening to a podcast on this subject too, because I got really interested in it. And the doctor on there was saying that, you know, menopause is, very individual like everybody goes through the different symptoms and doctors are used to a list a check you know like this yeah. is this represents this because that's and, how they're trained and that you know because they're not given enough information on menopause whenever they get these symptoms they're like redirecting it to something else and not putting it all together and understanding that it is you know this part and I feel like women always get, you know, shrugged off, you know, like, oh, you're just being moody or oh, emotional. You're being overly yeah, sensitive. And it's like, <laughs> these are actual hormonal crap going on inside of us. Like, 
it's just not given the the respect and the consideration that it really should. No, no, they're not even looking at the fact that premenopause is starting in 30, 30 year olds because yeah, and- 10 to 15 years in it. So now you look, why does this matter to us? I guess you could say as beauty professionals because of their skin. When you think of their skin and their overall health, even their muscles, like everything about it, you're catering to their well being in a sense from the outside in, if you wish. But when you're targeting, you know, like you talked about the holistic side, you talked about all these things are a matter of that mental health side, which you can do so much for them. Yeah. So much for them. Like you look at the trends of all the little handheld tools and all these little things people are doing at home and they're, they're bringing light, red light therapy home so that they can use it on themselves every day. Cause we lose, Oh, what percentage of collagen? I can't, I used to have this numbers on my head. Yeah. But it's huge amount. Once menopause hits, it is, I hate to say, but it's, a, it's just like a downwell. So really why, bad. and this is a good thing you bring up, like why we should care about it. Because the point of that is that this is a stage of life that the beauty industry should be a part of. Mm-hmm. That women, that seven in 10 women are looking for brands that address their hormonal needs. And then that hormonal wellness, right? That holistic yeah. thing that you were talking about. So in part of looking for trends and what's coming, I think that as part of it, like brands that are kind of incorporating hormonal wellness into their products. Or your equipment. Uh, in their you equipment. Exactly. Equipment, your galvanics, your, like yeah. you think of all the different, you know, investments you've made as a beauty professional. Do you have it right sitting there that you haven't plugged in for a while or charged up and it? because you've been focusing on your micro needling, which is awesome. But do you add the LEDs to that treatment? Do you, what do you do to change it? So you target that and uh, you know, I've, menopause is huge. Uh, yeah. It's just a big thing. I've, I've seen the difference after my operation last year, the texture of the skin, the elasticity of the skin, the density of the skin. And it's not just on the face, the neck, it's like your whole body muscular wise, like there's so much involved and we want more. We, we're trying to do what we can to stay yeah. youthful and, you know, not saying that, you know, I've got to look like I was 30 years old, but I still want to have top skin as long as I can, you know, mm-hmm. and have the natural aging happen, which is fine. But we're challenging what that is considered now, I think. What's the natural aging? Yeah. When we and have you- help and tools and treatments and yeah, there's lots of things out there. And I think the power that estheticians or the the role that they can play can also be the educational part, like yes. explaining to, because education and information is one of the things that is not easily available. Well, I mean, it's out there, but you have to do your own research and always start from scratch, right? That you can become, you can self-educate, I would think. I don't know where they would get the, the esthetician would get the information, but mm-hmm understanding what happens to the skin and the body as it goes through menopause and sharing that information with your clients on an information sharing, not as a, you know. Yeah. Not a prescription style. Prescription base, but you know, Hey, have you thought of this or whatever? Well, if you correlate it, an antioxidant, I don't know, you have berries in your face mask, right. Or yeah. vitamin C it's like, Oh, so when you think about food, what are you ingesting that you, you know, why don't you search that? Go on Pinterest and say antioxidant, you know, recipes or, and help give them ideas. Or mm-hmm. do you know of someone that you follow and you can share their recipe and just remember copyright, but that you don't take it as your own. Yeah. But if you're just sharing information, I think it's a valuable tool. And yeah, menopause, people are thinking they're like, okay, my age and older. No, starting younger, you guys. In your 30s, you don't realize after babies, yeah. you start very quickly and some have, and, you know, fully full on menopause before they're even 40 now. And it's that perimenopause is rarely ever discussed. I don't think I heard of perimenopause until recently. And I'm like, what? Oh, no. <laughs> Whoops. <laughs> it's the preventative side, right? So, yeah, yeah, no, there's some great, great information out there and how you yeah. can. Um, you know, but you have to be inquisitive and ask why and keep asking why. And then you learn more and more. And then you can, like I said, you'd be a little more 
creative on on your services and the information education you give your clients it can't just be about gossip or Mm -hmm. I don't know like or you know summer vacations it's summer right now so I just say that but and it's good to have those conversations but remember they're coming to you for a service so educate them on something new that you discover that's what I'm I'm always I always have said to me knowledge is power yeah just because you didn't get to the show like I'm like Doreen tell me what you learned and then Mm -hmm. tear on so she can share yeah Yeah. exactly awesome thanks thanks so much for listening and we'll be back next week thanks for listening to beauty babble 